So I'm um, a paediatric and adult dermatologist. Um, I do paediatric dermatology once a week. Um, and my interests are inflammatory skin disease and also in rare diseases. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, eczema as an introduction and the background and some uh, new information we have about eczema. Um, and then Jean is going to talk more about um, emollients and treatment. And then I talk a little bit more about treatment in hospital um, and some new treatments. Um, and then a couple of other things, and then we'll go on to talking about the cases. Um, so this is a picture of how, you know, eczema was treat treated in the past, <laughs> uh, which thankfully we don't have to do anymore. <laughs> Um, so, I think one important point is that atopic eczema uh, affects a lot of children, so up to 20% in the developed world. Uh, it definitely has an inherited component, um, and we know that a lot of patients with eczema, with, especially with severe eczema, have a skin barrier defect. Uh, there's also obviously an immune component, so the immune system, uh, and an environmental uh, influence. Um, and this is just a little schematic of the skin showing the skin barrier and basically the skin barrier keeps pathogens, allergens and irritants uh, out and it keeps water in. So if you've got a very leaky skin barrier, uh, you know, water is going to leak out and you're going to have dry skin. Um, and this protein, uh, filaggrin, which is mutated in eczema and seems to be the most important inherited factor in eczema, is expressed in the very upper part of the skin. Uh, and that's the part where the skin barrier is. So the skin barrier is this layer up at the very, very top. Um, and about 10 to 15 years ago, there were two big, big papers showing uh, mutations in filaggrin in ichthyosis vulgaris, which is where you get dry skin on the arms and legs, which is worse in the winter, with increased lines on the palms, and atopic dermatitis, also known as atopic eczema. So there's a couple of interesting things. One in 10 people of European origin carry one filaggrin null mutation, and they have only 50% of the normal amount of filaggrin in their skin, and they have dry skin and a high risk of eczema, 60%. One in 400 Northern New Europeans, so mainly white Irish and Scottish people were in this study, carry two filaggrin null mutations. This is much more common in the Bangladeshi population, and we estimate about one in 25. So you can see there's a huge uh, difference. Um, these people have no filaggrin protein in their skin. They have severe ichthyosis vulgaris and a very high risk of eczema, over 90%. Um, so the prevalence has increased uh, over the last 30 years. And there are thoughts that this might be environmental, query Western lifestyle, etc., etc. So we know from studies done in Dhaka in Bangladesh <coughs> about 15, 20 years ago that there was a 6% incidence of eczema in the Bangladeshis in Dhaka, whereas in Tar Hamlets it's more like 20%. However, we know now that the incidence of uh, eczema and asthma are both increasing in Dhaka, probably in with increasing industrialization. Um, there is no doubt that eczema is more severe uh, and there's an increased uh, prevalence in the Afro-Caribbean and Asian populations. So diet and atopic eczema. So 7% of ch children generally have food allergies. And food does not generally cause atopic eczema, but food allergies are more common in atopic uh, children. And I believe you've been talking about cow's milk protein allergy earlier. Um, but what I generally say to parents is I agree, yes, it is possible that food may be contributing to your child's eczema. But I say eczema is largely genetic and we need to treat it first. And if it's not responding to treatment, then we can think about food allergies. The exception is the small baby with failure to thrive, so the infant with failure to thrive who isn't doing very well and who uh, might have bowel uh, symptoms or there's an ob obvious history of deterioration after exposure to cow's milk. So this is just a little schematic, uh, a graph showing the um, atopic dermatitis from the age of three months uh, to 72 months and various allergies. Uh, so as you know, egg allergy may become a parent, you know, six months or later, 12 months, a peak at 18 months, and then it seems to improve. 
uh, cow's milk allergy uh, again seems to improve with time and nut allergy seems to become a problem more of a problem uh, later in life um, I didn't include but there is some evidence there's very good evidence now that exposure to nut early in life can prevent nut allergy and that's something that's been done in Israel for many years with Nana which is like a, a nut a peanut containing snack like Liga sort of the baby suck um, one other thing that we often come across in clinic is uh, mom comes in with a toddler with bad eczema who's 14 months old. The baby looks obviously iron deficient uh, and mom is giving goat's milk. So it's very important to emphasize goat's milk is not adequate nutritionally for babies and toddlers. Uh, again, no soya-based milk before the age of six months and after six months allergy testing first because in cow's milk allergy there's 60% cross-reaction with soya at least. So when I first started doing dermatology we always said to people, oh, 90% get better by the time they're adults, but now we know that that's not true. I mean, there's good evidence that that's not true. So 40 to 50% clear by the age of six and 75 to 80% clear by the age of 16. And many atopic adults develop irritant tanned uh, dermatitis. There seems to be a worse prognosis in more severe eczema and also with food allergies. So this is just a schematic uh, showing the atopic march. So quite often uh, children with eczema will also have food allergies, uh, upper respiratory problems, allergic rhinitis and allergic asthma. And you can see that, you know, the food is the blue line coming down and the inhaled is the, the orange line going upwards. Um, so asthma, as you know, the diagnosis is normally not made until after the age of five. So just some uh, patterns of eczema. This is uh, flexural eczema um, on the backs of the knees and the neck. Uh, this is the extensor pattern, which we quite often see in... Um, children between the age of, of 5 and 10. Uh, this is the imp impetigenized uh, seborrheic eczema, which we often see in infants. This type of eczema actually generally has a really good prognosis, even though it looks really alarming at the time. Uh, this is papular eczema. This is uh, follicular eczema, which is a pattern that we see in black skin, mainly. Um, you can sometimes see it in Asian skin also. Uh, this is di discoid eczema, where you get these uh, coin-shaped uh, patches. Um, quite often, uh, this type of eczema is impetigenized and requires antibiotics, um, plus or minus dermal 500, so bath additives with uh, anti-infective agents. Uh, this is lichenified uh, severe eczema on the legs. This is erythrodermic eczema, babies red all over. Uh, we don't I like to see them when they get that bad. It's better to, to, to refer them before that happens. Um, this is just really impetigenized eczema around the eyes. Um, more uh, impetigenized eczema. Recurrent boils in a family, uh, query PVL. Uh, eczema herpeticum, which we quite co commonly see. I mean, this is an, an, an extreme case, but you get these little punched out uh, lesions, usually most marked around the eyes and the ears. This is a very early uh, case. You could just see a little <coughs> bit of the circulation here, but it's in a cluster. Uh, and there's a couple of lead lesions here as well, so that's a giveaway for herpes. This is eczema coxacium, which is a fairly new entity in the last couple of years. Uh, generally widespread fasciculation. Baby is generally well, whereas an eczema repeticum, the baby is generally unwell with a high fever. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I think it can be hard to tell, to be fair. You know, so if I wasn't 100% sure the baby had a fever, I probably would give acyclovir anyway. So I'll hand over to Jean. <coughs> Thank you. Um, well, I've put this up to Bath or not to Bath. I think Adele will actually be covering a little bit more about um, the recent Bath trial about bathing. At the moment, we generally do, um, particularly in hospital, like children to have a bath every day. 
with some additives and we do usually still at the moment use bath oil and definitely a soap substitute and whatever you're doing all children should have something as a soap substitute. Um, it is worth asking families how they bath, um, I'm sure most of them are not doing it in the middle of the road but um, quite a lot of families do actually rinse off their children once they've bathed so they may actually be rinsing any emollient off them <coughs> which may not be particularly helpful. Um, quite a lot of families also do bucket bathing which is a bit like showering and again may not be particularly helpful for children who've got very widespread eczema and might actually do better um, soaking for a while. We generally recommend um, sitting in the bath for 15 to 20 minutes. If families are going to be uh, washing their babies' faces particularly or children's faces in the morning, get them to use their soap substitutes at that time as well because they often don't and water by itself does have a drying effect so we do want to counteract that. Um, there's a list here of emollients, there are lots of different ones. Um, generally um, you want to try and use the greasiest um, that families will tolerate. There are some children who do not like to look shiny and greasy and therefore you're going to have to amend your practice but generally um, children in this area are often extremely dry and will do better with ointments. Lotions like Dermal 500 which does have antiseptic in it are probably really only good as a soap substitute. They're not a good moisturiser, they're really much too light and also when left um, as a leave on moisturiser actually can sometimes be irritant so we really almost never use that as a moisturiser and getting them to try and bring the, remember to bring their treatments is really helpful and then we can show them again if they're getting stuck. Um, just to say there's a lot of nasty old herbal treatments doing the rounds, the one at the moment I think is Etin um, but Wawa has come back um, all of these contain potent topical steroids, so they all contain at least betanovate. Quite a lot of them have dermavate. So if you get families coming and saying, I got this off my neighbour or my sister, and it's really good, well, it will be really good because it's very strong. Uh, no idea how it's been mixed up. Families actually pay quite a lot. Um, and you know there'll be something com else coming along. I think um, some of these are not, OSAS is no longer available but, um, and I think magic cream has been withdrawn but there'll be something else so if you have your suspicions the MHRA will be happy I think as long as you've got proper packaging to actually do an analysis for you but I think we all have to be suspicious that there's something horrible in them if they're working so well. Um, so yeah and there is some etin out there if anyone wants to have a look and Chinese um, treatments often do have steroids as well. Sometimes parents um, will go and get a pot of goodness knows what from somewhere and it will be completely unlabeled and they'll be happy to use it on their children which um, is a worry as well. Um, okay and if you really need to be put to sleep you can read the nice guideline. The quick reference guide is actually much better, it's, that is much shorter and is actually quite sensible I think and there is quite a good flow chart in there as well. Uh, and they also did some more work and there are now some quality standards but um, yeah okay Great. thank you we're going to look at some cases but yeah if you right. have some questions I think we've still got a little a bit to do slides, yeah. Yeah, a few sorry. more slides Julia a few more slides is that right <coughs> sorry <coughs> we're passing those around anyway I guess yeah um, so the bead study um, there's been quite a lot of talk about that um, and it compared 483 children with atopic dermatitis um, who were under the care of GPs so it was a primary care based study um, and approximately half received bath additives and approximately half slightly less than half received none and basically the outcome measure that was used as the primary outcome was the patient oriented eczema measure um, 0 to 28 uh, low scores are better um, and the mean in the bath additives group was 9.5 and the mean in the uh, no additives group was 10.1 and over 16 weeks uh, the mean was 7.5 versus 8.4 so there was a small decrease in the bath additive group but no important uh, difference. A clinically significant difference in POEM is supposed to be 3 points. So you can see it went down by one point, but not by three points. So I guess it was mild to moderate eczema mainly. In a sub-analysis of the under five subgroup, uh, there was a decrease of two points with bath additives, but not the three points, which was declared as clinically significant by um, the harmonization of eczema outcomes group. 
I don't think it should be used as a reason to stop bath emollients in children with severe eczema as defined by using potent topical steroids. In the Bangladeshi population in particular, there's more infection and more severe eczema. Uh, so I think it should be prescribed if severe eczema, recurrent infections, the type of child who is hyperkeratotic, scabby eczema, because you know when they have a bath, they need to soften all those scabs and get them off. Um, or if the child seems to benefit from the sa from same. So, and, and also, I mean, I'm chair of the Medical Advisory Board, uh, board of the Ichthyosis Support Group, and many GPs have actually stopped prescribing bath emollients for patients with really severe ichthyosis, which is just, you know, terrible. Um, this is a child who has had too much potent topical steroid on the face, and you see this development of, of uh, sort of telangiectasia and a sort of an eczema crackle type appearance. The other sign, actually, if, if, if somebody's been applying cream with potent topical steroids that you can see in babies very easily. Uh, so, for example, with Abido or Wawa cream, you get massive vasoconstriction. So, in an Asian child, the skin will look really, really white. And, it's, you know, and the mum will say, oh, the eczema is all cleared, it's fantastic. Uh, but it's really, really clear that topical steroid has been applied when you see these patients. Um, so topical immuno, uh, immunomodulators that we use include tacrolimus and pomecrolimus. We don't have pomecrolimus on formulary uh, in Whitechapel. Um, it's regarded as the equivalent to a mild to moderate steroid. Uh, we mainly use protopic tacrolimus 0.1% which is the equivalent of betamethasone valerate. I use tacrolimus on the face when there's failure of humivate, when there's long-term humivate is needed, so very bad eczema on the face, or when there's steroid atrophy. On the body, um, when long-term potent steroid is needed or there's steroid atrophy. 0.1% tacrolimus is the most effective. It's also, I think, helpful in darker skin types as you get less altered pigmentation. You have to warn about uh, a tingling sensation with an initial use, and it can be prescribed by GPs uh, with an interest in dermatology, not just GPs with a special interest. So, you know, anybody who's confident to prescribe it can prescribe it. We also sometimes use uh, topical steroids under occlusion, so this is duoderm extra thin, or in some uh, kids we do uh, bandaging with dictopaste and coband, which works for very well for uh, localised eczema on the extremities, which hasn't been responding to treatment, and also obviously stops scratching. Um, narrow band UVB phototherapy sometimes helps in older kids, in, particularly in Asian and black skin because they tolerate phototherapy very well. Probably also increases their vitamin D. Um, in children who are not responding to potent topical steroids, tacrolimus, UVB if it's indicated, we would then think about oral cyclosporin, oral or subcutaneous methotrexate. Um, dupilabab is now available for adults. This is the first monoclonal antibody uh, for eczema. It's anti-IL-4 and IL-13. Um, it's been claimed to be transformative, but it probably won't be good as, as good as JAK inhibitors. Um, so there will be an early access scheme for teenagers over the age of 12 for dupilumab shortly. Um, when to seek help, I guess if you're not sure about the diagnosis, is it really eczema, does it look a bit weird, uh, very severe disease, uh, the child not improving despite use of adequate amounts of treatment, bad facial eczema if you're thinking about contact allergy for example, uh, recurrent infections, eczema herpeticum, um, poor school attendance, poor growth, ongoing sleep disturbance, uh, social issues, psychological issues, if child and adolescent mental health can help in conjunction with dermatology. This is just a little bit about eczema in Tower Hamlets. So convoluted calculation, but we reckon that between Newham and Tower Hamlets there are 11,144 children with atopic eczema, so that's quite a lot. 
Uh, eczema in the Bangladesh seem to be more severe, more admissions with eczema hepaticum. So for example, I have a colleague up in New Newcastle and I asked him how many patients would they admit with eczema hepaticum a year. He said maybe two or three. Um, in Whitechapel, we sometimes admit eight a week in the winter. Uh, more children require, requiring immunosuppression. We did a study in the early 2000s in 80 Bangladeshi families and there were lots of mutations in filaguin in both affected and unaffected individuals, but more in the affected. Um, this isn't so easy to understand, but there are 10 genes along the side. Filaguin is at the top and the number of variants, dark brown is 10 to 12, zero is white, pink and red are in between. And you can see of all the uh, ethnic groups, the Bangladeshis have the highest number of filaggrin mutations. Um, and I'm le leading on a study called the THEA uh, study, which aims to recruit at least 1,000 Bangladeshi children and young adults under 30 with eczema. Um, we're basically uh, looking at uh, the phenotype, we're looking at infection, we're looking at the correlation with uh, pollution, the skin barrier, and the genetic background. And we've recruited almost 300 uh, children now, so it's going quite well. We started last May. That's <coughs> uh, our little poster. And one interesting thing that has come so far from the study, this is just in, is in equal to 93 who happen to have a baseline vitamin D done, but the eczema severity correlated quite well with uh, vitamin D. So if your vitamin D is low, your eczema is going to be more severe. Um, so one good favour you can do for your patients, if you don't do already, if they've got bad eczema, is check their uh, vitamin D level or just prescribe empirically. So the RCPCH says if you think a child is vitamin D deficient, prescribe. So over the 18, age of 18 months, 3,000 a day. And over the age of 12 months, 5,000 a day. And the National Eczema Society. Leads.